Good evening and um, welcome to Scotland at 7, um, here at Broadcasting Scotland. Um, my name is Brian Liddy and, and tonight I can, I'm pleased to say that we have Maureen Watt with us as a guest. Maureen, hello, thank you again for joining us. How are you this evening? You're welcome. You're welcome, Brian. How are you? I'm not too bad, although I've just realised that I've, I don't have the mouse with me, so I'm going to have to read everything out manually. I hope you can forgive me. Um, so I'll start. Um, Maureen, how, how has your day been today? Just... Um, it's been mixed, I have to say, Brian. Uh, my mother-in-law died yesterday at the ripe old age of 90. Oh, I'm but sorry. But it's uh, still very hard, hard and... Uh, my husband is obviously very upset so yeah it's just holding things together here um uh, they've been to organize the funeral today so it'll mean my children coming home from paris and london respectfully so respectively for, for to be respectful i should say um so yes i'm sure many people go through this too uh but it's always very sad when it comes and I hope you've got your mouse to your hand now. I do, it's kind of crawled across. Maureen, I'm so sorry. Um, I've, I didn't realise, I didn't want to remind you of that when, and that makes it even more important then that you've, you've given time to be with us here tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, oh, okay, so we'll start with the Ukraine update for day 380. Yvonne Prigozhin, the founder of the Wagner Mercenary Group, today said he had thanked the Russian government for a heroic increase in production of ammunition, but he was still worried about the shortages for his fighters and the Russian army as a whole. US think tank, the Institute for the Study of War, had said in its daily update that Wagner appears to be taking a tactical pause in Bakhmut. The ISW believes that Wagner is waiting for until enough reinforcements of conventional Russian troops have arrived before taking a back seat in the fierce battle. Ole Sainhubov, the governor of Kharkiv, has said the energy situation is difficult following Russia's barrage of attacks on Thursday. Switzerland's government said on Friday it will not change its long-standing policy, banning the transfer of Swiss-made arms to a third country, despite growing pressure from countries to export them to Ukraine. The UN nuclear watchdog's 35-nation board of governors backed the reappointment of Argentina's Rafael Grossi to a second four-year term as director-general at a closed-door meeting today. Finland's Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, visited Kyiv today and met President Volodymyr Zelensky. They attended a church service at St Michael's Golden Dome Cathedral in memory of the soldier Dimitro Kotsubalo, who was killed near Bakhmut on Tuesday. Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulated Xi Jinping on Friday after the Chinese leader secured an unprecedented third term as president. Today, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said he sees risks of possible provocations in South Ossetia and, um, and Abkhazia to Russian-backed breakaway regions of Georgia after days of protests in Georgia over a foreign agents bill. The war in Ukraine is driven by the interests of several empires and not just the Russian Empire, Pope Francis said in an interview published on Friday. Ukrainian authorities insist they will continue to try to hold the eastern city of Bakhmut, despite suffering an estimated 100 to 200 casualties a day. Western officials have estimated Russian casualties in Bakhmut at 20 to 30,000. Belarusians' authoritarian leader, uh, Belarus's authoritarian leader has signed a bill introducing capital punishment for state officials and military personnel convicted of high treason. Russia has introduced personal sanctions against 144 government officials, journalists, lawmakers and other public figures from the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, deemed most hostile to Moscow. So um, Maureen, I won't ask you to um, pick out anything from that because that was one of the longer um, updates and we're a wee bit late <laughs> getting through the show as well. But I just wanted to say that um, you're, you were an MSP um, in Holyrood and also a member of the cabinet uh, and so uh, and also you're a regular contributor here at Broadcast in Scotland so um, once again um, apologies for missing out your introduction. 
before it's out of the show. Um, so I'll go on to the first item and then we'll find out what you have to say. Members of the EIS, Scotland's largest teaching union, have voted overwhelmingly to accept the Scottish Government's pay deal and the recent run of school strikes. Under the deal, teachers will receive a 7% pay rise backdated to last April, a further 5% next month and another 2% in January. The EIS suspended strikes last week when they rec recommended that members accept the revised pay author offer. The union said 90% voted for the deal from a from a ballot turnout of 82%. General Secretary Andrea Bradley said, while it does not meet our aspirations in respect of a restorative pay settlement, it is the best deal that can realistically be achieved in the current political and financial climate without further prolonged industrial action. It compares favourably with recent pay settlements across the public sector and does provide pay certainty for Scotland's teachers until the next pay settlement is scheduled in August 2024. Scottish Government Education Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville said, I am very pleased that EIS and the SSTA members have voted over overwhelmingly to accept this historic offer and I look forward to the Scottish Negotiating Committee for teachers giving it formal consideration in due course. It is the most generous offer to teachers in more than 20 years and one that is fair, affordable and sustainable for everybody involved. Teachers in Scotland are already the best paid in the UK and this deal will mean a salary rise of £5,200 in April for most teachers and a cumulative rise of 33% since January 2018. A resolution to this dispute and an end to the threat of further strike disruption at our schools will be a huge relief for children, young people, parents carers and teachers too. So, um, Maureen, I was having a wee look online um, before we started and it would seem to be that the, the key phrase on social media that people are picking up on is, let me see if I can find it, um, that fact that this package isn't going to be a restorative pay settlement. Um, so do you think then that this is a good deal or or not? I think on the face of it, it does sound a good deal. And the fact that 90% of those who voted, and it was 80 something percent of people, of teachers who, who voted for it, only 10% voted against it. I think that is a resounding endorsement of uh, what has been offered. Um, and it will mean that there will be uh, no more strikes and parents, children above all, um, and teachers can get back to some sort of normality and try to make up for <clears throat> the losses that have happened uh, to children uh, over COVID. And those who have got exams coming up shortly will be doubly pleased, I think, that this um, has happened. Of course, it's not restorative, but public sector pay has been falling behind virtually since the Tories came to office in Westminster in 2010. Um, so I think it's unreasonable to expect that uh, it could be restored in one pay deal. However, um, I think that the because we're talking about pay deals over, I think, three years, um, it does go some way um to uh make up for the losses but uh, not in any way um uh totally restorative of of what of of how public sector pay has been eroded uh over the years so i do hope that it will lead to some stability um for at least the next few years and hopefully we'll see inflation coming down and <clears throat> the money in people's pockets uh, overall go uh, further um, but as it, with anything with this Tory government we just have to wait and see. Thank you Maureen and I mean I can't help thinking that now that that's the Scottish government has another um, averted another strike in the public sector um, it's got another um, win under their belt I can't help being reminded of you know back when in COVID when lockdowns were happening and we were being told that bankers were not going to be more important in the new world and it was going to be public sector workers, um, refuse collectors and nurses. So hopefully this goes a little way towards making um, those kinds of changes. I'll, but I'll move on to the next item. 
Constitution Secretary Angus Robertson has written to the UK government urging ministers to ensure safe and legal routes exist in the UK for people in search of safety and protection from war and persecution. Following the introduction of the UK Illegal Migration Bill, Mr Robertson has written to Minister of State for Immigration Robert Jenrick to reiterate concerns about the UK Government's National Nationality and Borders Act and new plan for immigration and stress the likelihood of the bill increasing people's risk of exploitation and destitution. Um, Maureen, I've got a copy of the, the actual letter here, and there's a couple of passages that I'd just like to read out to you and um, see if they spark any response from you. Um, the Scottish Government has repeatedly raised concerns about the UK Government's Nationality and Borders Act and New Plan for Immigration. It is clear that the measures the UK Government has set out previously will not achieve the change that is desperately needed in our asylum and immigration systems to make it humane, dignified and fit for purpose. Your previous plans alongside this bill are likely to increase people's risk of exploitation and destitution. The Scottish Government does not support the bill for a variety of reasons and urges you to reverse your plans and not progress this damaging bill. And then one other says, um, with independence, Scotland can leave behind the hostile environment that characterises the UK government's approach. Instead, we would um, encourage and support people to make Scotland their home. Uh, do you think Angus Robertson's correct? I think he was uh, right to uh, write to the Home Office expressing his views, which I think are um, broadly reflective of um, the Scottish population. Um, I think, as many organisations do, um, that it is deeply inhumane. Um, it um, in no way um, is likely to stop the boats by itself, and it's unlikely to be recognised as legal internationally. Um, I think today's visit by Rishi Shunak to France and giving them almost half a billion pounds to try and stop the boats um, is, you know, they talk about not having any money, but yet they give half a million pounds uh, to this with no talk or nothing that I've seen in the press as to how this might be used. And this is not the first tranche of money that the um, French have been given in order to stop the boats. And there's been no discernible um, reduction in the number of boats coming across. Indeed, I think they have increased. So it'll be interesting to see um, how this money is spent and whether that will make any difference. I mean, I cannot understand why international agencies have not managed to stop these criminal gangs in exploiting vulnerable people uh, with charging them thousands of pounds to get on uh, an inflatable dinghy and cross was it 16 miles of open water uh, in the dead of night um, cannot be stopped um, you know we managed to break up drug cartels now and again um, and sometimes very successfully why have as far as i can remember none of these criminal gangs been stopped and exploiting vulnerable people. And the other thing I think we ought to remember is that there are at the moment no legal routes, as far as I understand it, to try and get into Britain. Okay, there are some you know, people who are going into high paid and supposedly really specialist jobs um, who might get in, but for people fleeing persecution um, and wanting to claim asylum, um, there are no legal routes to do that. So, and the other thing I think is really worth remembering, and I think it was over a, a number of media outlets uh, yesterday, is that Britain um, accepts very, very few uh, asylum seekers and migrants compared to our European neighbours. And that is you, the way the, this very right-wing Tory government speaks you would think that we were taking the vast majority of people um, who are uh, seeking asylum or uh, migrating to get away from persecution and torture. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah, I'd just maybe like to um, suggest that there are three things that, that spring to mind in this case. And first of all, there's the, 
you're absolutely right. Because there is no legal route, then it seems to me that the current Tory government actually has actually caused the small boats crisis. The second one is that it seems, um, I, I don't know if you would agree, we don't really have much time to discuss it, but it seems to me that instead of, as you suggested, instead of attacking the, the criminal element, um, the Westminster government has decided to attack um, the people that are um, being targeted or suffering the, the um, in, under the small boats. And then just the, the incredible irony that the word illegal is in the, the actual title of the bill. But um, if we're going to finish on time, I'd better move on. I'll try and interject less so we can hear more from you. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer um, visited Glasgow with Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves this morning as part of their campaign to set out their plans for the economy of Brexit Britain if Labour win for the, win for the government after the next election. Mr Starmer um, said that Scotland's spirit of innovation and creativity was being hamstrung by the current Scottish and UK governments and he promised to make Scotland one of the best places to start and grow a business if his party is elected in 2024. Responding to the visit, the SNP Deputy Westminster Leader, Mary Black, MP, said, Keir Starmer is happy to throw Scotland under Boris Johnson's Brexit bus, and as such, he has zero credibility in talking about Scotland's economy. Under him and Anna Sarwar, Labour is a pro-Brexit party that would do nothing to reverse the appalling damage the Tories are inflicting on Scotland, having dragged us out of the EU. Instead, Labour stands side by side with the Tories in keeping us locked outside the single market which is seven times the size of the UK's. So, um, Marion, it seems to me that I'm, I'm sure, I'm certain that in the past, um, I've heard Anna Sarwar make policy statements that, um, which are in the polar opposite of where Keir Starman is now. Um, Brexit's a good example, I think. Um, but it seems to me that the mainstream media, they don't seem to want to grill Sarwar to find out where he stands now whether he still is opposite to Starmer or whether he's changed his mind and now agrees with Starmer. Um, do you think he now maybe agrees with Starmer? Or is he just being quiet? Well, I, think he's, I think he's keeping very quiet about it, exactly, Brian. Um, and I think um, if the um, mainstream media are going to be doing a job in the run-up to the next election, then they need to highlight the differences between Scottish Labour um, and Keir Starmer, who is clearly moving to the right in order to try and win back um, these red wall seats. You know, the way that principles have been totally and utterly ditched uh, by the Labour Party um, at Westminster is just um, quite unbelievable um, in my book. Compare If you compare the Labour Party that we knew uh, in our younger days to now, it's just, you know, a shadow um, of its former self. And the Westminster parties have, have moved completely, both Labour and Tory have moved completely um, to the right. So um, it will be interesting, as I say, as uh, Labour begin, although they're ahead in the polls, as they begin to set out their stall, uh, just how attractive it is to voters in both uh, England uh, and Scotland and whether they maintain the big lead that they have at the moment um, in the polls. But his visit to Scotland is, you know, a day's press and, and little more. Um, and I think, you know, the caricature of eating a, 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 what do you call it, a battered Mars bar, I think, just shows you how, how they see Scotland, I think. Um, and clearly he knows nothing about the innovation that's going on in Scotland. And clearly his briefing hasn't shown, shown him um, that Scotland, I think, is third uh, in the UK after London and the South East in attracting invert investment to these isles. Thank you, Maureen. <clears throat> and that thing about the deep fried Mars bar being particularly Scottish and particularly unhealthy and um, a, a, a figure of fun. My understanding is that deep fried Mars bar came about um, from a, a fish and chip shop, an award winning fish and chip shop. I think it was in Selkirk and they um, invented I it. Was Stonehaven. Stonehaven. <laughs> I knew it began with an S. And <laughs> it was to show how good their batter was. Um, and I lived in England for more than 20, well, more than 20 years. And I saw um, um, deep fried Mars bars appear down in England long before I ever saw them in Scotland. But anyway, yeah. moving on. 
Um, the SNP has called on Rishi Sunak and the UK government to abandon plans to spend billions of pounds more on abhorrent weapons of mass destruction. The party's defence spokesperson, Dave Duggan MP, criticised the Tories for neglecting the UK's conventional forces amid sweeping cuts to infantry numbers and a host of base closures in recent years, and called on the UK government to divert funding to ensure the UK's capabilities were responsibly bolstered. Commenting, Dave Duggan MP said, The people of Scotland will not be impressed with colossal extra funding for weapons of mass destruction while communities face such material hardship during the Tories' cost of living crisis. For struggling families up and down the country, there are far greater priorities than funding nuclear armed submarines. We are all aware of the need to consolidate defence and security services in the wake of Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. But funneling billions more into abhorrent nuclear weapons is not the priority and will not assist Ukraine in their fight for freedom. Over 13 years, Tory, the Tory government has decimated the UK's conventional forces and capabilities while closing or downgrading bases across Scotland and elsewhere. Infantry numbers in particular are at their lowest point since the War of the Spanish Succession more than 300 years ago. Mr Duggan added, in an independent Scotland we will invest to meet Scotland's distinct defence needs that will never involve spending money on weapons of mass destruction. So Maureen, I'm um, reminded that when Boris Johnson was still Prime Minister, he told us that modern warfare had changed and wouldn't involve tanks and guns. Um, this was before the most recent invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. He, he went on to tell us that, it would, that, that modern warfare would be cyber warfare. He was wrong, wasn't he? Um, he was wrong, although I think cyber attacks are becoming more frequent and um, I think there's evidence that they are coming from the, um, Russia and um, perhaps China. So I don't think we uh, should ignore that. Um, but you're right in saying that Boris Johnson thought it would move away completely from traditional warfare. And... Um, clearly, we've seen with Russia's attack on Ukraine that it is, it has come down to the old of First World War trench warfare. Um, and my husband and I actually were in France last week, and as we were coming back towards Cali, we stopped at Arras to try and find the grave of my husband's great uncle. Um, and we went to um, Vimy Ridge as well, where we you can see uh, how trench warfare uh, was carried out. And that's exactly the same type of trenches that are being built, um, are dug in, in, in Ukraine. And I think the difference now is, to get back to the subject that we're talking about, is that the ultimate weapon that Putin threatens with is nuclear weapons which are available now and weren't um back then and it's just unbelievable that you would think you you would increase that weaponry when we should be looking at at um, multilateral disarmament instead of uh, armament and um discouraging countries from going down the nuclear route by ourselves showing that um we can um uh, do away with nuclear weapons, uh, either unilaterally to make a to take a stance, or much better multilaterally. Uh, um, but clearly, the the idea of that happening while this w w war in Ukraine is going on and and Putin's around is perhaps a little um, far fetched. Uh, but nevertheless, that should be the direction of travel and not increasing spending on nuclear weapons. I mean, I can't understand that Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, would be in favour of that when he's crying out for um, uh, money and resources uh, for um, traditional, um, for the traditional armed forces uh, rather than nuclear weapons. Thank you, Maureen. And of course, there's another strand to this story that we haven't really had time to talk about, which is the fact that Scottish taxpayers are having to pay for this, um, the huge amount for this um, nuclear arsenal, even though they regularly or repeatedly vote in governments that don't have Trident in their manifestos. Um, so maybe we can talk about that another evening. I'll move on to the next item. 
The BBC has decided not to broadcast an episode of David Attenborough's flagship new series on British wildlife because of fears that steams of the destruction of nature would risk a backlash from Tory politicians and the right-wing press, according to reports in The Guardian. The decision has angered the programme makers and some insiders at the BBC who fear the corporation has bowed to pressure from lobbying groups with dinosaurian ways. The revelation about Attenborough's programme comes at the end of a week in which another broadcaster, Gary Lineker, has been condemned by Conservative ministers for his criticism of the UK government's immigration bill. The Fresh Row focuses on Wild Isles, a highly anticipated new series looking at the beauty of nature in the British Isles, which will begin broadcasting on Sunday. Narrated by David Attenborough, it is expected to be a hit, with five episodes scheduled to go out in primetime slots on BBC One. A sixth episode has also been filmed, which is understood to be a stark look at the losses of nature in the UK and what has caused the declines. It is also understood to include some examples of rewilding, a concept that has been controversial in some right-wing circles. The documentary, which was part funded by nature charities, the WWF and the RSPB, will not be broadcast along with the others and will instead be available only on the BBC's iPlayer service. All six episodes were narrated by Attenborough and made by the production company Silverback Films, responsible for previous series, including Our Planet, in collaboration with the BBC Natural History Unit. Senior sources at the BBC are reported to have told The Guardian that the decision was made to fend off potential critique from the political right. This week, the Telegraph newspaper attacked the BBC for creating the series and for taking funding from two charities previously criticised for their political lobbying, that is the WWF and the RSPB. One source at the broadcaster, who asked not to be named, said... Lobbying groups that are desperately hanging on to their dinosaurian ways, such as the farming and game industry would, kick off if the show had too political a message. <clears throat> Caroline Lucas, the Green Party MP for Brighton Pavilion, said, For the BBC to censor one of the nation's most informed and trusted voices on the nature and climate emergencies is nothing short of an unforgivable dereliction of its duty to public service broadcasting. This government has taken a wrecking ball to our environment, putting over 1,700 pieces of environmental legislation at risk, setting an air pollution target which is a decade too late, and neglecting the scandal of our sewage-filled waterways, which cannot go unexamined and unchallenged by the public. So um, this, um, Maureen, um, Boris Johnson recently nominated Paul Dacre for a senior post in the BBC, I believe, I think I'm right in saying, and Richard Sharp, who became BBC chairman after um, donating or giving, gifting Boris Johnson £800,000, who then went on to become BBC chairman after he'd done that. So, Do you think all these kind of point to um, the BBC being in the pocket of the ERG group, which is part of the Tory party in Westminster? Well, I think it's deeply disturbing that right-wing lobbyists can force or influence, have so much influence on the BBC um, that they are not um, broadcasting um, on BBC One or BBC Two, whichever it is, uh, the sixth uh, programme uh, in this series, but yet it's available on iPlayer. It seems a bit ridiculous not to just uh, show it um, on, on, on BBC when you can access that so easily now uh, on iPlayer and I'm sure more more people will uh, access it now than might have otherwise as, as a result of this but it does um, show that the BBC's impartiality is really uh, at strain now and at breaking point uh, kowtowing uh, to the ERG and, and right-wing um, lobbyists and as you mentioned the fact that uh, Richard Sharp um, facilitated um, the loan uh, to Boris Johnson by uh, Paul Dacre and then was thereafter still given the chairmanship um, of the BBC. Oh, well, maybe I've got that wrong about the loan. Anyway, it's, it was a Canadian far uh, distant cousin, wasn't it, of, of Boris Johnson. But anyway, um, I think... Um, the whole thing really stinks and the impartiality of the BBC is really in question now 
And you mentioned Gary Lineker. I think uh, he uh, today has stood back from um, being uh, the front of sports programmes on the BBC today. And Ian Wright has also um, agreed with Gary Lineker and is standing back. So that is a big yeah. blow for the BBC. Um, but it's really great that somebody like those two are standing up to the BBC. I think the impartiality clauses in contracts, whether you're an employee of the BBC or come in on a sort of cons consultancy basis or self-employed basis, uh, really need to be looked at. But they really seem to have got themselves in Queer Street over this. Yeah, I can confirm that Gary Lineker has, this is breaking news, um, Gary Lineker has been suspended as match of the day presenter after the corporation said his criticism of the government's asylum policies breached its impartiality guidelines. Um, but I, I, again, we don't have much time, but um, I found it was astounding that, um, that, oh, I'm told that Ian Wright has also stepped back as well because he supported him. Um, but I was astounded that the news coverage seemed to be more obsessed with um, covering Gary Lineker's statement than the, the than the than well, apparently Alan Shearer has been caught up in it now as well. But um, so, yeah, so yeah, so but I'm 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 I was really more uh, completely astounded that the media coverage um, was more interested in covering Gary, Lin Gary Lineker's tweets rather than what he had tweeted about, which was the cruelty of Suella Braverman's bill. Um, apparently it was even, it was a top item, the opening item on the BBC News at 10, I'm told. So, yeah. So the next item, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has denounced a brutal act of violence after a shooting that is reported to have left at least seven people dead and dozens injured at a Jehovah's Witness Centre in Hamburg on Thursday night. The police said the gunman was believed to be dead and that the motive remained unclear. Herr Schultz said his thoughts were with the victims, while the Jehovah's Witnesses community in Germany said its members had been targeted in an horrific attack. Attack, forgive me. Build newspaper reported that seven people were dead and 25 others injured, of which eight were seriously wounded. It is unclear if the attacker was included in the death toll. Police said that several people were seriously injured, but declined to say how many had died. Soon after the attack, which began at around 9pm on Thursday, a police spokesperson said, We have no indications of a perpetrator on the run. Later, police said that they had found a lifeless person who we believed could be a perpetrator at the centre, but investigations were ongoing. As news of the shooting emerged, Hamburg police said that a major operation was underway in the Gross Borstel district of the city. Several streets were sealed off and the public warned by text message to avoid the area. Local residents were told to stay indoors and only use their phones in extreme emergency so as not to overburden the network. Police from a specialised army unit were already near the scene when the shooting happened, local media reported. They happened to be on their way back to accommodation at their headquarters in Alsterdorf, where the gunshots were reported. NDR reporter Heiko Sander told Tegesschau that the police nearby acted after hearing several shots being fired. They entered the building and started evacuating people, including a woman who was pregnant. A police spokesperson said that when officers arrived at the scene, they found several people seriously injured and some dead. Then they heard a shot from above. They went upstairs and found one further person. Some 175,000 people in Germany are Jehovah's Witnesses, including 3,800 in Hamburg. Um, Maureen, um, I wonder if maybe have you heard any more about this um, story than, than we've covered in the report? Well, it's really awful and, um, you know, normally we associate incidents like this um, with terrorism, but this clearly, at, so far as we know at the moment, isn't linked with terrorism. It seems to be linked with a, a dis disaffected former uh, member of that Jehovah Witnesses church um, who went on the rampage um, there. Um, one of the things that disturbed me in listening to some of the coverage of this was that the police um, did get an anonymous tip-off um, that this person 
uh, had guns and um, a large stash of ammunition um, and was behaving in an erratic manner. Um, the police apparently did visit but didn't take any action at that point. So I suspect there will be lots of questions on why that perhaps wasn't taken more seriously, but such a tragic um, occurrence uh, yesterday and the fact that one woman was seven months pregnant just makes it even more horrible. Yeah, it's a shocking um, event. I wonder if maybe mental health is part of the mix um, rather than terrorism, as you say. So um, I'll move on to the next item. President Biden is to visit Belfast to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, despite the Democratic Unionist Party's continued boycott of the power-sharing government that the, P the Peace Pact established. The US President, who is of Irish heritage, is also expected to travel to Dublin as part of his wish to mark his family connection while in office. Dates have yet to be confirmed, but he is likely to visit in the second half of next month, days after the 10th of April anniversary of the agreement re reached by the former British and Irish Prime Ministers Tony Blair and Bert Bertie Ahern and the former US Senator George Mitchell. <clears throat> it is understood White House pre-advance teams have already been to Dublin and Belfast with initial assessments on security and policy matters to be discussed on the trip. Bill and Hillary Clinton are expected in Belfast around the same time for a large event on the 17th to the 19th of April, organised by Queen's University marking the, the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. It's thought that Mitchell, who chaired the peace talks in 1997 and 1998, may also attend the event. President Biden has long stressed the importance of the 25th anniversary of the agreement, but a trip was in the balance while the UK and EU remained in dispute over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now the way has been cleared after Rishi Sunak struck a revised protocol deal with the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen 10 days ago. Forgive me, I've read that wrongly. Now the way has been cleared after Rishi Sunak struck a revised protocol deal with the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen 10 days ago. The DUP will not make a decision until April at the earliest on whether to back the Windsor Framework deal. Joe Biden last visited Ireland in 2016 as Vice President and it is thought his visit could last five or six days, taking in trips to the counties of Mayo and Louth from where his ancestors came. The trip could be officially confirmed next week amid St. Patrick's Day festivities in Washington, expected to be attended by party leaders from north and south of the Irish border. So, um, Maureen, is, is this soft politics, do you think? Is this America gently reminding the United Kingdom government at Westminster that they will not, and perhaps the, um, the DUP in Northern Ireland, that they will not get a trade deal, for example, if they don't protect the Northern Ireland Protocol? Yeah, I think Joe Biden has more or less articulated that al already, has he not? Um, and I think it is uh, interesting um, that Biden is still sticking to his line about how important the Good Friday um, Agreement is uh, to the United States and how it should not be watered down um, in any way. And um, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, just how much the um, the Windsor Agreement, uh, what, what effect that has on the, the Good Friday Agreement. But um, I'm glad he's spending uh, what seems to be a great deal of time in, in Ireland, um, perhaps combining a bit of a holiday, as you say, to visit his um, forebears, um, uh, places uh, where uh, they came from. Um, but also, I hope he there is time in his diary for him to, to meet um, the DUP and Ulster uh, unionists to if I may, may say, drag them into um, the, the 21st century and see how cooperation and uh, recognising um, the strength of the ballot box and how people voted in Northern Ireland um, at their last um, devolved assembly um, elections is really important um, and that um, they must allow now Northern Ireland, although it may affect 
um, how Scotland fares um, to um, make headway in terms of restoring uh, democracy, restoring um, their assembly, as I say, and get to grips with the many um, problems that Northern Ireland is facing, not least the fact that their health service hasn't been reformed to meet the current um, uh, crises that they are facing along with other uh, health um, services throughout uh, the whole of the British Isles. So um, I think the, the, um, the visit will be really interesting um, and I hope some long-term good can come out of it. It's, it's interesting that George Mitchell, after 25 years, is maybe coming along as well and that I'm sure will add extra weight uh, to the delegation and um, hopefully we might see some movement uh, from the hardline uh, of the, the Unionists in Northern Ireland. Yeah, it is fascinating watching this all kind of unfold. Um, I saw an item today caught my eye about how Northern Ireland, because of the, the special position it holds, being um, part, not part of the, uh, having access to the EU via Ireland and still being part of um, Great Britain and the United Kingdom, there's going to be problems that, that down the line had to do with food standards. This was about, they actually talked about arsenic in baby food. Um, the European Union is um, reducing the levels at which um, arsenic can be in baby food. I have no idea why there would be any arsenic in baby food at all, but this seemed to be an issue. Um, and Northern Ireland is going to have to choose whether it follows the European Union or or the UK when it comes to baby food production there, and um, and of course people are urging the UK to to follow the the EU so that it doesn't become a problem in Northern Ireland. I don't know if you hear, heard any other stories like that. Um, I think I think that's just one example. Of, although I'd never heard of arsenic in baby food. Why on earth would you put arsenic in in baby food or any food or for any that food, matter? Yes. Um, but um, I, I think that, I mean, all these things that were warned about before people voted for Brexit are now coming home to roost. And the idea that having our own standards and things like this is going to make things easier and not more complicated. All businesses are saying that it's making everything much more complicated. They've got two or three systems to work with instead of one system. And businesses, you know, are part of the of the clamour now to say that Brexit is a complete and utter disaster because it is making things, as I say, very much more complicated um, than they need to be. And, you know, talking about getting rid of all um, the EU's laws and things like that, something else has got to be put in its place unless they're just going to transfer them across, which they're determined and being just bloody minded and saying that we're not adopting or keeping them um, is making things, as I say, much worse for business and trade and investment. Um, and as I say, these things are coming home to roost because those of us who were warning about the dangers of Brexit um, are now being proven to be right. So I don't think there's an easy fix to this. The Windsor Agreement may go some way um, to helping that, but if the if the unionists are dragging their feet and not making up their mind about this till next month, um, then you know you can see that there are going to be problems and obstacles put in the way by uh, the unionists in Northern Ireland. And I mean, when you watch them on on television, Brian, I don't know if you notice, but you know you see the Sinn Fein leaders in in the south and in the north. You know, young, bright women wanting to get on with things. And then these old fuddy-duddy middle class, middle aged men in, you know, grey suits trying to stop everything and delay everything and live in the past. It just makes me so angry. Yes. And um, I think it's amazing how many stories, um, when you dig down into them, Brexit is behind it. Um, you find that more and more these days and that kind of leads us on to the next story quite neatly. 
a cross-border trial has improved care for patients prescribed multiple medicines. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. A cross-border trial has improved care for patients having who have prescribed multiple medicines. The Eye Sympathy Project, funded by the European Union's Interreg VA programme, worked with professionals in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland to comprehensively review patient medication. Taking multiple medicines can be problematic if the increased risk of harm from interactions between drugs or between drugs and diseases outweighs the intended benefits. Interim findings showed these interventions potentially prevented major organ failure, adverse drug reactions and avoided hospital admissions and saw patients move to a more appropriate medication. Project funding, managed by the special EU programmes body, the SEUPB, was match funded by the Northern Ireland Executive, the Irish Government and the Scottish Government. Scotland's Public Health Minister, Mary Todd, said, This project looked at some of our most vulnerable patients taking more than five medications. The reviews have avoided adverse combinations of drugs and hospitalisations, while also reducing prescriptions and drug costs. We will know more when the full evaluation is published in June. We will work with partners to see how we can see the, how these improvements can be applied more widely, potentially saving lives and money. So, Maureen, I wonder, with your experience working in the Scottish Parliament, um, can you add any, give us any insight into how this sort of um, partnership comes about? Well, prior to Brexit, of course, there were a great many cross-country or inter-country um, um, projects um, like this. I mean, in order to access EU funding, most projects and uh, research projects had to be uh, cross-border. And I was uh, involved both as an MSP, uh, but also as Minister for Public Health for a while in, in some of these. And, you know, some of the stuff was really great work in improving the, the lives of populations um, across Europe. Um, this one, I, I think, is really interesting. I mean, I think all of us um, who are getting older and have elderly uh, relatives know that sometimes GPs, you know, pile drugs upon drugs rather than, you know, often getting a review. Although I have to say against myself that with more and more pharmacists being located and allocated to GP practices, there, there is more of a reviews of people's medication than there perhaps um, has been in the past. Nevertheless, um, I don't think many people take time to uh, read um, the notes that come um, with their prescriptions. Um, um, you know, I sometimes make myself do it now and again. But um, I think there is uh, the possibilities that one drug can react against another to the detriment of the health of people. So I think um, I haven't read much about this, to be honest, um, up till now. But I think uh, reading the reports that come out in, in July, I think you said, Brian, uh, are going to be really interesting. And I hope um, that the findings, um, if, if suitable, can be uh, implemented and rolled out to GP practices um, as quickly as possible. It will save on on the drug budget and perhaps um, improve the quality of life too. So it's good news. Yes, and and just just quickly, Maureen, do you think is it telling that um, the the Westminster government wasn't mentioned in that list? Um. Not really, because, you know, I can think of other projects where Scotland, um, I'm thinking of one that uh, the James Hutton Institute was involved in with uh, uh, universities and, and institutes in, in Poland, and I think it was Spain. So um, in this area, I think Scotland, uh, because we have got high quality universities and high quality research in those universities, um, are often teamed up um, with other um, countries other than, than than England. You know, we do it with England too. But um, and one of the awful things about Brexit is that that's less likely to happen now uh, rather than than happen because, of course, movement of of 
of people and and academics in this field, you know, um, is, is really important too. And getting short term visas to perhaps locate um, in Scotland from wherever we're collaborating with is made much more difficult. So, you know, the fact that this is one of the ones that has survived and is happening is um, is probably against the odds, if if uh, if you like. I think. Okay. Then thank you for that. So I'll move on to our final item. The first UK-wide televised debate between the SNP leadership contenders took place last night. Channel 4 televised the debate live from Glasgow. Viewers saw a more moderated interchange between the three candidates, Kate Forbes, Ash Reagan and Humza Yousaf. Humza Yousaf told Kate Forbes that the Scottish Tories are rooting for you to win so that your words are on every single leaflet which was a reference to Thursday's First Minister questions when Douglas Ross, leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, told the First Minister that Forbes' comments in the previous debate on Tuesday had sorted every Scottish Conservative leaflet going forward. Yusuf went on to say that Forbes had given opposition parties ammunition to attack us with. Ash Reagan said it was perfectly acceptable to admit what the SNP may be able to do better and said it is time for change. Host Krishnan Gurumurthy probed all three candidates on their religious and moral beliefs. Forbes repeatedly refused to say whether she thinks abortion is mor morally wrong, but she did say that she is willing to work with Scottish Green MSP Gillian Mackay on her member's bill to introduce buffer zones to protect women and healthcare workers from anti-choice protesters, but that balance is required. Forbes said, <clears throat> asked by Yousaf whether that balance would apply to prayer vigils currently taking place outside clinics in Glasgow and Edinburgh, Forbes said, it boils down to a question of honesty. Does Humza accept my word when I say that I will uphold those legal protections and support buffer zones or not? After the debate, Yusuf said he was pleased there weren't the same personal attacks as there had been at the previous televised debate on Tuesday. Forbes said Humza stated yesterday that he would be unremittingly positive and I'm not sure how long that has lasted. In a surprise move today, Tommy Sheridan said he could be tempted to join the SNP if Ash Reagan becomes the next party leader. The next hustings take place in Edinburgh tonight, and tomorrow there will be two more hustings in Glasgow. There will be an SNP members hustings and an STUC hustings. So, um, Maureen, I um, can't wait to find out, what do you think of the show so far? Well, I'm a member of the SNP's National Executive and I am going to work with, I'm going to have to work with whoever is elected by uh, the membership. So I am not declaring um, for anybody. I think that um, what has happened so far has come as a bit of a shock uh, to SNP members because, of course, we haven't had a leadership um, election in the SNP for about 20 years, I think. So um, given the current way that leadership contests in all parties are conducted and so much of it is now on the media, in the media, um, I think um, it has been interesting and perhaps more forthright than many people um, expected. Um, we're having one of these hustings in Aberdeen on Sunday, which I have got a ticket for. Um, so it will be interesting to see in person um, what the the dynamic um, is. And I'm looking forward to it in one way, but it does clash with the rugby. So um, I'm going to be rushing away to come home and see Scotland and Ireland. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> conflict of interests um, um, <laughs> between the rugby and the um, um, the fact that this this most recent um, televised debate, Channel Four debate, was was a more moderate one. Do you think that maybe means that the th all three contenders were, have been taken aside and maybe quietly reminded about the damage that was done to the, the Conservative Party when they had their very long and um, vicious uh, leadership debate, uh, thinking of when it was Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. 
Yes, I mean, um, you know, what we've seen so far in the in the SNP one has was nothing like um, what has happened in, in the leadership elections uh, of the Tory party, of which we've had a good few um, recently. Um, I think, as I said, I think there was surprise at how personal um, the STV one um, got, and perhaps there was an agreement between all three that um, they shouldn't trash um, what the SNP um, government um, has done, which of course they were all um, part of a government um, that agreed um, how they, they should conduct um, the affairs um, in Scotland. So it's, it's a bit counterproductive, uh, really, because they were all part of it. Um, so, yeah, I think we, I wish it was over tomorrow, but it's not going to be, I think, uh, don't know, is the ballot boxes, the ballot papers go out on Monday, is it? Um, so I can't wait for it to be over, to be honest. But uh, yeah, we've got to endure it till about the 27th of March, I think it is. So yeah, a few weeks of this. Um, but I think there are perhaps two more uh, debates on television. Uh, but I think it is important that members get the chance to, uh, as I say, see the hustings in person, uh, throughout the country and it must be quite grueling for the candidates as they try to reach as many parts of Scotland um, as possible um, but yeah they've put themselves up for this so it will be interesting to watch. Thank you Maureen and we've only really got a couple of minutes left but it's interesting to see how the debate or, or how the, the, the leadership campaign is um, influencing things like First Minister's questions. Did you see FMQ's um, yesterday. Um, yes, um, I, I did. I, I thought Nicola Sturgeon handled it uh, very well <laughs> when she said uh, that uh, Douglas Ross is unlikely to, to reach even uh, uh, mediocrity. I thought that was uh, an excellent uh, response. Um, but, you know, the, the, the job of government uh, still goes on. The First Minister is there till um, the end of this month, I think. And uh, there is still, um, as I say, lots of day-to-day -day th day things that need to be done. So um, it is interesting in Scotland that we've not had the situation before, I think, where um, we've had this, certainly not in the SNP anyway, where we've had this leadership contest um, at, 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 to, to a point to, to, to vote for the leader of the SNP and at the same time, the First Minister, it must have happened uh, with Labour, of course, because we had when Donald Dewar died. I can't remember, did we have a, was there a contest when Hen, um, when Henry McLeish and then Jack McConnell took over? I can't remember, to be honest. I wouldn't like um, to say without yes, checking. Uh, it is in the dim and distant past. <laughs> it is in the dim and distant past. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, quite new for Scotland, I think. Yes, and if any of our viewers... If you don't watch FMQs, or if you haven't caught up with the most recent one, I would thoroughly recommend it. It is really quite something. Um, well, that's about... Oh, yeah, and we, we, um, we um, broadcast it live usually here on Broadcasting Scotland. But that's just about it for this evening. Uh, Maureen, thank you once again for your time and um, sharing your, your insights. It's been, um, been really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you, and we'll hope to see you again soon. So um, before I go, I just want to remind you that broadcasting, here at Broadcasting Scotland, we depend on the generosity of our supporters. So to everyone who has donated and to everyone who has signed up to make a regular monthly payment, thank you very much. Our programmes will always be free to view. However, if you can afford £5 per month, please consider becoming a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. We have set ourselves a target of adding 10,000 new subscribers to enable us to employ staff to make more programmes. So, um, good night and thank you for watching. <laughs>